Coming up on the Wednesday edition of Carolina Week. I'm Tara Higgerson. Election results are in. The student body has a new leader. And I'm Lindsay Michael. You might be able to save some of that book money soon. In sports, the lacrosse season begins this weekend. We'll show you how the Heels are preparing for the nation's toughest schedule. Weathercaster Laura Pagano is here with your four-day forecast. Carolina Week starts right now. From the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this is Carolina Week. Hello and welcome to the February 15th edition of Carolina Week. I'm Shaheen Sayal. And I'm Philip Jones. UNC students have a new student body president. Reporter Tara Higgerson joins us live in the newsroom with a recap of Tuesday's elections, which only saw two candidates running for the top spot. Tara? Phil, students cast their votes throughout the day online for student body president. The polls closed at 10 p.m. and candidates and their campaigning staffs anxiously awaited the results. Bernard A. Holloway had 2,362 votes, and James Allred had 3,290. When the Board of Elections announced James Allred as the new student body president, he thought, get ready. We have so many great ideas, and we're ready to go on them. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm ready and that Carolina's ready to see the kind of improvement we've been talking about all year. The race for SBP began in January. It was a race with only two contenders, Chapel Hill native James Allred and out-of-stater Bernard Holloway. The results weren't as close as students expected. Allred captured more than 3,000 votes, beating Holloway by nearly 1,000. With red eyes, Holloway received hugs from supporters, but says he wasn't going to cry. It hurt. It was like a shot in the chest or in the stomach. But, I mean, you know, it was okay. I mean, you got to pick up, keep moving on. Allred says he wants accountability from the administration regarding tuition hikes, dorm storage space, and improved academic advising. But first, he's going to take a deep breath. i got to spend the next few hours with my staff uh, just relaxing. We've been really high strung all day and really for the last several weeks, so we're ready to kick back a little bit, let our hair down, and uh, really enjoy the success. Allred will officially take office the first week of April, but he'll already be meeting with current SBP Seth Dearman on Thursday, as well as other campus officials later this weekend in order to get ready for the big challenge. Tara, now that the election is over, what's Holloway going to do? Holloway told me he's going to pick up the pieces of his life. He's going to go back to classes, start cleaning his room, and Phil, I bet Allred's probably going to be doing the same thing in addition to catching up on his studies. All right, Tara Higgerson, live in the newsroom. Thanks, Tara. Two candidates for senior class president and their running mates have one more week of campaigning left. Douglas Weiss, Jewel McDonald had 569 votes. Meg Peterson and Eric Schmidt had 589 votes. Juniors Meg Peterson and Doug Weiss are headed for a runoff election. Peterson earned more than 20 votes, more than Weiss, but that wasn't enough to win a simple majority. That's because Jonathan Friedman and running mate Barry Turner earned about 330 votes. Now Peterson and Weiss have one more week to win over the juniors. Both say they're happy to be in a runoff. What do you think the next week is going to look like? It's going to be crazy. Yeah, um, it's going to be know, really crazy. Just trying to remind everyone to vote again on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, so just That'll be the, the most family. important part. We're just really excited that we got to this next step. I mean, I'm really glad that students kind of connected with our platform. We just got to make up 20 votes, and I really feel like that's something we can do. You can vote on Student Central next Tuesday in the runoff election. The results are also in for Student Hall, for, excuse me, for Residence Hall Association and Student Congress. William Thompson will be the new president of the RHA. He won easily, running unopposed. His first official duty will be to fill his executive board. Voters elected members of Student Congress in nine districts. The new Congress will feature 30 new members. 13 members were re-elected, including Speaker Luke Farley. Counting votes isn't the Board of Elections only job, but almost no one on campus knows what those duties involve. What does the Board of Elections at UNC do? What does UNC's Board of Elections do? <laughs> wow, that's a good 
That's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Nothing. Um, takes care of elections. Well, she's on the right track, and Carolina Week found a man with all the answers about the BOE, Board Chairman Nicholas Mosley. Mosley says his eight-member board plays a unique role. I guess you could call us the referees. We, or the referees and the, the CEOs, we, we're the people that make sure that the elections run well. Anything um, university-related that we're required to run the elections on. Mosley says one of the board's toughest jobs is keeping campaign workers away from students who don't want to be bothered. College students are not known for having much presence at the polls. They represent one of the lowest voter turnout groups in national elections. Our own campus elections mirrored that trend. According to the Associated Press, 42% of all eligible 18 to 24 year olds voted in the 2004 presidential election. Here at UNC, only 6,000 students cast ballots in Tuesday's elections. Senior Madison Perry says it helps everybody when students get involved. You know, the more that your average student is willing to participate, the more can be done. Like, I think that, you know, one candidate can do a lot, but without the backing of a whole student population, it can't really accomplish very much. Experts continue to debate why college students aren't interested in going to the polls. One issue all the new officers will need to look at is the spiraling cost of textbooks. Lindsay Michael says there's already a move in student congress to help battle the big time book bills. In an effort to bring textbook costs down, UNC student congress member Caroline Spencer helped pass a resolution that encourages professors to keep the same edition of a book for at least three years before switching to a new one. Not really binding, it just says one pot, it, that they wait three years when possible. Student Stores is also joining in the effort to bring costs down. Director of Campus Merchandising John Jones says higher textbook costs also come from bundling, which is when textbooks are packaged with extras such as workbooks and CDs. Bundles cost students more because the publisher uses a new textbook in the bundle even if a used version is available. We're not a fan of bundles. Uh, almost no one is a fan of bundles. Take a look at this bundled textbook. Along with a workbook and CD, this costs more than $250. Joan says students are getting fed up with the high prices. My students are going elsewhere where they can purchase those used books. They're going off campus, they're going on the web. But are the bundles even needed? Spencer says they not only add extra cost, they add extra materials like these that students don't even use. The little grammar book we all have for English 11 and 12, I came with a CD. I've had numerous books that come with CDs and I've never used them. Spencer says with the help of faculty, textbook prices can come down and the supply of used textbooks will go up. With more used books on the shelves and more money in their pockets, students will have extra change to spend on that much needed cup of caffeine at exam time. In Chapel Hill, I'm Lindsay Michael, Carolina Week. UNC System President Erskine Bowles is also backing a set of recommendations aimed at reducing textbook prices. It seems like book prices always put financial stress on students. And Shaheen, a new survey shows for some of them that money, the money that they pour into books could soon be paying off. The survey shows that college seniors in most majors are looking at an increase in starting salary offers, with starting salaries different according to the degree. While engineering majors still get top offers, accounting or economical and financial degrees follow close behind. The lowest paid starting salaries go to liberal arts majors, but even those salaries are up compared to last year. A new version of the graduate record exam will create a little more work for students planning to take the test next fall. Students already put in a lot of hours in the library to prepare for the GRE. Proposed changes for the exam will go into, go into effect in October 2007. The new test will be longer and more expensive, making it more challenging for students, for students to get the score they need for graduate school. Senior Heather Muller took the GRE this past fall. She says students should try to take it before it changes. When they change it, I'm sure there's going to be a few things that they're not sure about. Um, and so I'd rather not be the first people who go through that new experience until they work out every problem. The new exam will last four hours instead of two and a half. And the testing fee will also increase. 2007 could be a busy and fulfilling year for some UNC students. They could be spending three intense weeks studying astronomy in Chile or studying the life cycle of a fruit fly. It's part of the Maymester program set to start next year. The courses will offer hands-on experiences in small classroom environments. Administrators are aiming to improve students' research and international experiences. 
Phil, who says soap operas are only for women? Coming up on Carolina Week, a look at a locally produced soap that's for both sexes and that crosses cultural lines as well. When I found out my jeans were made using child labor and sweatshops, I wrote a letter to the company saying, reconsider your labor practices. A few months later, I get a letter back saying, thanks for being a loyal customer, and they included a coupon for a 25% discount on their jeans. So I got smart, wrote letters every day to all the stores that carry the brand, asking them to stop supporting the companies who use child labor and sweatshops. And I just kept getting letters back, thanking me for my concerns, and more coupons for more discounts on more jeans. So I'm telling my friend about it, and she flips out, saying that between all the letters and coupons, some paper company cut down a small forest driving off two indigenous tribes, hundreds of endangered animals, killing thousands of plant species, some of which may have contained vaccines for HIV, cancer, and syphilis. Meanwhile, the guys cutting down the trees are 13-year-old kids who will work night and day for months just to save up enough money to buy a pair of jeans made by child labor in sweatshops. The push for extra safety measures for pedestrians continues in Chapel Hill. This is a town where people walk and bike and jog. The widow of one of the victims killed in recent accidents, Dr. Maida Galinsky, and others have petitioned the, the Chapel Hill Town Council to, to do more to keep us all safe. Council member Sally Green presented the petitions. Green says the town has to do a better job working with the state to make Chapel Hill a safe community in which to walk or bike. Certainly it needs money. The state has money. We can find money. It's not easy, but, 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 but these solutions can be found. One of the main problems is that many intersections are not controlled by the town of Chapel Hill, but by the State Department of Transportation. Spam mail has bombarded millions of inboxes in the past few years, but now AOL and Yahoo are asking companies to pay at least a quarter of a cent per email as a way to eliminate spam. This new strategy will create a preferred class of email that will separate the junk mail from the legitimate mail. However, if a company doesn't pay that price, its emails could automatically be, be filtered out. AOL user Jean Manning says she'll switch to another email service if the plan goes through. AOL is going to profit, but it's going to be at the expense of its customers. And I'm an AOL customer, and this infuriates me. I don't want the company choosing what email I receive. I should be able to choose what email I receive. The Senate Commerce Committee will also review a net neutrality bill, excuse me, because the plan might threaten the openness of the Internet. Well, Phil, the election wasn't the only thing on people's minds Tuesday. That's right, Shaheen. Valentine's Day had several men concentrating on last-minute shopping. By lunchtime Tuesday, many floral shops were left with nothing but scraps. University Florist says sales were higher this year than in the past few years because flower sales tend to be higher when Valentine's, Day's, Valentine's Day falls in the middle of a work week. Tuesday was also a big holiday for restaurants. Top of the Hill had room for only three walk-ins during dinner. Though they fall on the same day, they're not the same thing. V-Day doesn't stand for Valentine's Day. It's a global movement to stop violence against women. As part of UNC's V-Week, members of Men Against Violence Education held a discussion Tuesday night to increase awareness on campus about this growing problem. Through a series of exercises, the goal was to create a better understanding of the scope of violence against women and talk about strategies to promote a less violent world. The growing Hispanic population in our area now has a TV program of its own. Alex Villarreal reports from the set of Our Neighborhood, also known as Nuestro Barrio. This Spanish soap opera filmed in Durham? Believe it or not, it's true. The local newspaper Que Pasa calls Nuestro Barrio entretenida y educativa, entertaining and educational. And that's exactly what the miniseries crew shoots for. Assistant Director Luke Barrow says the show is not only educational for viewers, but for cast and crew as well. It's a very diverse cast and crew, most diverse crew I've ever worked with, uh, which has been the best part. You know, there's been so much to learn about other people and, and other ways of life that I just haven't been exposed to, especially with the Latino community. I'm here now on the set of Nuestro Barrio. Let's take a look. Quiet on set. The cast and crew of the soap opera, including creator Dilsey Davis, gear up for production. 
4.3, take 4. And action. Hey, Christina. Mexican actor Alonso Rodriguez plays Ramon Diaz on the show. Así que te fuiste a comprar un auto. Rodriguez says he knows firsthand the importance of Nuestro Barrio's lessons for Latinos. Es importante que it's important that people know sepan, these things. Uh, esto, que son, that for some of us, para de now, nosotros, are very basic. Básicas, but I remember when I arrived here, I didn't know anything about how to crédito, set up a bank account, de, um, about what I needed to do, and if I should carry my cash with me all the time tiempo, or keep it at home. If you'd like to watch but you don't speak Spanish, don't worry. The show has English subtitles. Tune in to WB22, Channel 10 with Time Warner Cable, Saturdays at 1 p.m. In Durham, Nuestro Barrio. I'm Alex Villarreal, Carolina Week. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Moving on. Okay. Next. Nuestro Barrio tapes in Durham, and the producers are often in need of extras. Warmer temperatures could soon save natural gas users a little green. PSNC Energy recently asked state regulators to lower natural gas rates as a result of the warm winter weather. If the North Carolina Utilities Commission approves the rate reduction, gas bills will match what customers paid in the early fall of last year. The typical household would see a $5 monthly reduction. And after the uh, about two week snap of cold weather that we've seen here lately, I'm certainly glad uh, that Wednesday brought us some warm weather. That's right. Then weathercaster Laura Pagano joins us now. Laura, I the only thing about this warm weather is that I bought a new jacket, <laughs> and I was hoping that I could wear it today, but temperatures felt like spring outside. It sure did, and um, well, I don't know. Maybe you'll get to wear that jacket sometime soon. This week started off chilly, but temperatures are slowly climbing up. Some people are already wearing their springtime gear, so there'll be a need to put those clothes um, away again. Passing gas can be deadly. Whoa, oh, something's funky. Passing gas releases a plume of toxic vapors. Oh, oh, honey, not in the car. Like ammonia and hydrogen cyanide. Oh and lethal poisons that can linger even when windows are open. Kids shouldn't be exposed to secondhand smoke. Don't pass gas, take it outside. I heard about this company dumping toxins in local rivers, and I called their executives to say stop. But they were too busy counting profits while the rivers were being destroyed, birds and fish are dying, and the local kids are getting cancer. So I organized a huge protest, and we actually got the company shut down. But now half the town's unemployed, and the kids are twice as sick since they can't get health care, since their parents lost the insurance they had when they worked for the company who dumped all the toxins in the first place. Hi, and welcome back to Carolina Week. I'm weather forecaster Laura Pagano. As you may feel outside, it is very warm, um, but will those temperatures be staying? I'll come up, I'll tell you about that in the future, and we'll see that sunny skies are prevailing for most of this week, with showers possible on Saturday, and then warm to cold, yes, that is coming. As we look at the satellite image, we can see that we do have an area of convection right in the middle of the country, and if out west we also have another area of convection, and this will be sliding on east, but as we can see, the east coast, beautiful conditions right now, and that will be sticking around until about Saturday. If we zoom into our area, we will be able to see that, again, we have beautiful conditions all the way down to Florida, and then we see out toward the west that we do have an area of um, convergence that will be sliding on east, and that will be affecting our area for this weekend. Let's take a look at the radar, and we'll see that no sort of no no precipitation in this area at all. If anything, precipitation will be in the west, and that will be coming on through. But for the next two days, we will have very warm conditions. So if you want to head to the park or maybe take a bicycle ride, it would be perfect time to do it this weekend. So um, as we can see that. If we move to the surface map, we have a, um, two troughs that are going to be moving on east. Um, this is a very unique condition because we have two cold fronts back to back to each other. So that means that this weekend we will have be getting co cooler temperatures. And then into the next week, well, cooler temperatures again. So 
I would suck in the fact that we have warmer temperatures, and if we look out west, we can, oh, okay, if we look at the four-day forecast, we will see that Friday and Saturday, beautiful conditions, high around 70, and then Saturday, we have showers, and then Sunday, that system will be pulling on through, and if you look at the temperatures, 20 degree difference from Friday. And if we say you want to go to the beach because you think it's warm outside, well, I wouldn't be too sure about that because we see on Saturday, we only have a high of 52 and rainy conditions, and then Sunday, only a high of 46. So I don't think you can get a tan at the beach this weekend, but say you want to go to the mountains to go skiing. Well, you might have a good chance because we might have some snow coming up. And if we take a look at um, the ski report, we will see that for Sugar Mountain, we have a base of 40 to 80 inches and new snow. Trails open, 20 um, of them are open at this time. So if you want to go skiing, it, the best time would do to be do it, doing it now. Great. I think Friday and Saturday are going to be beautiful, and I might get to wear my jacket on yes, Sunday. Yes, I think so. <laughs> well, thanks, Laura. All right, thanks very much, Laura. Sportscaster Michael Crow is here with us, and uh, the UNC men's basketball team has a big ACC matchup on Wednesday night. Yeah, they sure do. We'll have a tough test Wednesday night facing Georgia Tech at home. But first in sports, the UNC baseball team got some good preseason news this year. Tar Heel pitchers are chasing an award named after one of baseball's all-time greats. I can listen. I can cook. Good. I can coach. Kids with something to do are less likely to do drugs. I can drive. I can paint. I can dance. A little of your time can make a lifetime of difference. I can read. I can help. You can help. Call toll-free 1-877-KIDS-313 to find out about community drug prevention programs. I can keep a kid off drugs. For the 1.3 million children living with AIDS, we can do more than just learn the facts about HIV. Through Caring for Kids 101, a campus outreach program, college students nationwide are helping to end this deadly disease. Half of all newly infected people are under the age of 24. Your assignment, get involved with Caring for Kids 101. Every child deserves the chance to live a healthy life. Support the Elizabeth Blazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Welcome to Carolina Week Sports, I'm Michael Crow. Let the games begin. The baseball season starts this weekend and hopes are high. Reporter Jen Manis has the story of two players who are on a prestigious preseason list. Come game time, you can find the baseball team here at Beauchamer Stadium, or you can find them here. Tar Heel pitchers Daniel Bard and Andrew Miller scored spots on this year's Roger Clemens Award Watch list. The award goes to the nation's top college pitcher. Miller insists that although the praise is nice, this preseason prize isn't his main focus. None of these really count. It's the end of the year honors that count, and uh, preseason stuff happens all the time and doesn't work out. It's, it's my goal, I guess, to have all of them stick at the end of the year. Coach Mike Fox agrees. He says he's proud of his players, but says they need to earn the praise. They've still got to go out and perform. Talent's you know, only going to get you words on a piece of paper, but performance is what gets really people talking about it. It's this mentality that also drives Bard. He says he prefers to rely on his teammates for support. They're just your teammates, they're your friends. They're not, you know, any kind of celebrity status or anything. We're just, we're just friends, they're all on the same level when you get in the locker room. With preseason accolades under their belts, these Tar Heels must be doing something right. Tar Heel fans just want them to continue that into the season. In Chapel Hill, I'm Jennifer Manis, Carolina Week. Carolina takes on Seton Hall at home this weekend. It will be a tough test right off the bat. Pun intended. Well, hope springs eternal, and the men's lacrosse team hopes the squad will fare better than it did last year. Reporter Whit Walker brings us the story. Listen up, Tar Heel sports fans, because it's time to suit up for another season of the fastest game on two feet. This year's Tar Heels men's lacrosse team starts the season rated 14th and 18th in the two national preseason polls. We're going to be a very determined team and, and, and we'll be ready week in and week out and I know that they'll play as hard as they possibly can. The team boasts two preseason All-Americans, senior attackman Ryan Blair and senior defenseman Stephen McElduff. Hard work and excitement. Uh, 
It's one thing kind of Carolina Crossman always been good at is getting up and down the field and scoring a lot of goals. The defensive unit looks to flourish with four returning players. However, they'll have to lend a forceful hand to a new goalie. Freshman Grant Zimmerman and Taylor Sheehan are currently competing for the spot. Another question will be the young attack unit featuring freshman Bart Wagner. A little different because, I mean, we're much younger. We lost a lot, a lot of guys in a lot of starting spots. Despite the talent, the learning curve for the newbies and vets alike is going to have to be steep since the Heels have the toughest schedule in the nation. The Tar Heels Conference schedule features number four Maryland, number three Virginia, and cover your ears, top-rated Duke. Ouch. I think the beauty of our squad this year is that all these teams that are ranked ahead of us in the preseason, we're going to play most of them. In Chapel Hill, I'm Whit Walker, Carolina Week. The men's basketball team will be looking for its 16th win Wednesday night against Georgia Tech. A win against the Yellow Jackets will move the Tar Heels into a tie with Boston College for third place in the ACC. The Heels will need to stop Tech's Zam Frederick, who had a career high 22 points against NC State Sunday. UNC is on a run. They've won four of their past five games. And let's not forget about softball. They're off to a great start. They're four and one. Their first home game is this Friday. All right, thanks very much, Mike. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Well, Tar Heels often sing about their love for the special place that we call Carolina. Going to Carolina. <laughs> this particular Tar Heel has plenty of love to share with others. Two kings, two jacks. Nice hand. 220, we've got a polyp at City Park. 220, we're on it. You never know when a colon polyp is going to show up. Into the dive oh. Get the polyp early and stop colon cancer before it starts. Don't wait for symptoms. Get the test. Get the polyp. You hate me because I'm a player. Get the cure. If you have a story idea, contact Carolina Week at 843-8292. You can also visit us online at carolinaweek.org. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27599. Don't stop cuddling just because it's not Valentine's Day. Research shows that hugs are heart healthy. Whether it's as a group of best friends or maybe with just a study partner in the pit, a simple hug between classes really pays off. UNC researchers found that hugs can lower blood pressure and reduce the risk of heart disease. Even a couple of Carolina Week anchors embraced the idea. The study also showed that hugs resulted in greater reductions in blood pressure for women than for men. <laughs> Speaking of hugs, Shaheen, how was your Valentine's Day? Well, actually, Phil, I was here with you during the election show, so it was what it was. Well, most people would consider that a blessing, but some rivals were able to unite for a good cause. Reporter Sean Maroney has that story. You couldn't escape that type of love as a helping hand hosted a special serenade in what founder and director Kathy Aronson says was a holiday miracle. Here at the height of basketball season, we have uh, Duke and Carolina sharing the same stage and singing about love. Now, where else can you find that? Not in many places, but despite the fact we all have our own favorite shade of blue, red was the color of choice. Longtime friends Dorothy Blythe and Elizabeth Caldwell enjoyed the moment and the mixed company. We go back, I forget you what to do. We are such good friends, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> we understand each other. And this understanding spanned across generations for the holiday. There's a lot of talent here this morning and a lot of love in the room. They were excellent. We were, we were happy to share the stage with them. Uh, a little friendly competition, I guess. I guess. Uh, <laughs> doesn't hurt. Going to Carolina. Feeling the love in Chapel Hill, I'm Sean Maroney, Carolina Week. And that's all the time we have for this edition of Carolina Week. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.